All right, good evening and welcome. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. I want to thank you for joining us here in the library and also to those joining us online. I'd like to tell you about next week's program titled In Conversation, The Crisis of Democracy, Domestic and International. The program is moderated by Elizabeth Coleman, one of the country's leading innovators in higher education and the former president of Bennington College. Our special guests that evening include Mansur Farhang, who served as an advisor to the Iranian Foreign Ministry and as ambassador to the United Nations. From 1983 to his retirement in 2014, he taught international relations and Middle Eastern politics at Bennington College in Vermont. And the other guest is John Limbert, who was one of the hostages in Iran and is a retired Foreign Service officer and academic, having served as ambassador to the Islamic Republic at, of Mauritania. He was a professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the US Naval Academy. This is an important topic, but also a rare opportunity to have these three esteemed individuals together. So I hope you'll join us. That is next Tuesday at 5.30, and it's here in the library and also online. I'd like to thank the Manchester Community Library for welcoming us all here. And thank you as well to GNAT TV for partnering with us to bring this program to those watching online. Please silence your cell phones. And during Q&A, we will have a microphone um, that will come to you. So when you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the mic. And for those online, please type your questions in the chat feature, and Liz will monitor those. Our community is fortunate to have many opportunities to enrich our cultural learning experiences. The Southern Vermont Arts Center is one such organization doing that. And it is always a pleasure to have our guest with us again. She joined SVAC in 2019, most recently from the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia, where she had served as the Director of Education. Prior to her tenure at the Chrysler, she was Director of Education at both the Reading Public Museum in Pennsylvania and at the Delaware Art Museum in Wilmington. She holds a BA in Art History from Rosemont College in Pennsylvania and an MA in Museum Education from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. She has part participated in the nationally known Getty Leadership Institute for Ag Executive Education. She currently serves as president of the Manchester Business Association and is a member of the Vermont Curators Group and the New England Museum Directors Roundtable. Please give a warm welcome to Anne Corso. All right. Um, I'll give it just a second for let to let uh, Liz test the microphone. I'm, I'm very mic'd up and wired here. So um, thank you very much to, to Gloria and to Liz and for the GMAL community for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to speak. And thanks to all of you um, for coming out this evening to hear this talk. It's both exciting and slightly intimidating uh, to see so many familiar faces who know so much about the Southern Vermont Arts Center and about the topic that um, I'll be speaking about this evening. So let me get started. We'll take questions and hopefully comments at the end. Um, you know, as I quipped in my lecture description, I said, you know, ask a Vermonter to name a famous painter from the state, and you'll likely hear the names of Norman Rockwell, Luigi Lucioni, and maybe Wolf Kahn. Now, ask a group of people to name famous women artists, and I bet you could name two or three. You'll probably Georgia O'Keeffe, Frida Kahlo, maybe Mary Cassatt. But how many women artists from the state of Vermont are on the tip of our tongues? Well, just a few years ago, if someone had asked me this question, and someone like me who has spent my entire life in the arts with a particular interest in women artists, 
I likely would have drawn a blank. But in the past few years that I've been fortunate enough to call Vermont my home, I've been able to dig deeper into some of the stories of the artists, the women artists, who have really shaped uh, the Southern Vermont Art Center, this institution that I love so much, and that uh, these women have had such an incredible uh, presence and left such a lasting mark on the organization, um, on our community, and hopefully on our history. So over the next 45 minutes, hour or so, I want to tell you a little bit more about these 10 remarkable women artists and one very important patron. So before you know, I launch into our women, I'll share just a tiny bit of history about the Southern Vermont Art Center. So before it was technically an art center, before it had a physical home, it was just an idea. It was an idea that this picturesque corner of Vermont could somehow provide visual fodder for painters and that there would be a market for their painting um, and that they would be able to create something lasting and meaningful in the farms and mountain valleys of this area. And so in 1922, when a group of five artists showed their work at the town hall in Dorset, they had actually been painting together during the summers for decades, but it just happened to be that year was the year that the local community took notice and something magic happened. They became known as the Dorset painters, these five painters, who likely many of you know, Edwin Child, Francis Dixon, Wallace Fonstock, John Lilly, and Herbert Meyer, who will play into our story just a little bit later, um, formed the nucleus of the Southern Vermont artists. And so in 1924, at the urging of uh, a prominent Manchester resident, these Dorset painters, along with a few folks from Manchester, held what would be the first of many, many annual exhibitions at what was then the Equinox Pavilion. The shows were held in the late summer, not so different from today. Everything here happens in the late summer. Um, and the local residents um, came out to view, to support, and to purchase those works. So over the years, more artists um, joined the fold, and the exhibitions grew in size and popularity and notoriety. Um, through the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, with the exception of the wartime years. So here up on the screen, there are two images, both from the 1930s, um, that show some of the founding members of the um, Southern Vermont artists. So above, starting in the front row, we have Elsa Bly, B. Jackson, Dean Fawcett, Edith Snare, Wallace Fonstock, and Clay Bartlett. And then in the back row, we have Bob McIntyre, Bernadine Custer, Marion Hughes Barstow, Herbert Meyer, Harriet DeSanchez, and Felicia Meyer. So in our second photo, some of those folks repeat. But in the front, we have Hilda Belcher, um, Bernadine Custer, Wallace Fonstock, Norman Wright, uh, Horace Brown, John Lilly, and then in the back row, Harriet Miller, Mary Powers, Herbert Meyer, Henry Schnackenberg, and Clay Bartlett. Um, but there we go. Um, but on a parallel track, while the artists were exhibiting in and around Manchester, a very, very bold woman was creating what might be one of the most important parts of the SVAC legacy up on the hill. Well, tell us, okay, all right, all right, good, good, good work, Donna. Just let's keep going. Okay, so you're imagining that you're looking at this very elegantly dressed woman and you're looking at, um, 
Yester House in, in the background. So Gertrude Devine Ritter Webster um, is our first woman of SVAC. Now, she was born about 70 miles west of Chicago in 1872. Now, she was college educated, so following her studies at the University of Michigan, she settled in Ohio, where she was very active in the arts and an extremely active philanthropist. And in her mid-twenties, she married a, name by the, uh, a man by the name of William Ritter, who made his fortune um, in the lumber industry in West Virginia. So in 1917, the couple hired the very prominent New York City architect, um, architectural firm of Murphy and Dana to design their summer home on the land that had been previously owned by Charles Orvis. So as they began to build their home, they named it Yester House. Um, it boasted some 28 rooms, and uh, the land grew uh, at its largest, I think, to about 300 acres. There we go. And you were right, Donna. We can just imagine that as, as, we're, as we're running through. Um, now, in local history, there's much more, and I would say probably too much emphasis made on uh, Gertrude's marriages and divorces. She divorced Ritter in 1923, um, maintaining the property and, and certainly enough money to keep it going. And in 1924, uh, she married Hugh, uh, Hugh Webster, whom she later divorced as well. Um, but though her marital history might be interesting, uh, she was certainly accomplished in her own right. In Columbus, um, Ohio, she founded uh, the, that city's chapter of the Big Sisters. She was the president of the city's fine arts gallery. She amassed a nearly 6,000-piece collection of fine art glass, documented it, and published its history um, and in her adopted home of Phoenix, where she moved later in her life, she founded what is now known as uh, the city's desert botanical gardens. So when she passed in 1947, um, Yester House and its property became available. So the Southern Vermont artists, who were incorporated by 1933, purchased the home in 1950s, and the Southern Vermont Arts Center was born. So, uh, so get, steering back to our women artists, I, I introduce you um, to our first artist here, Mary Swift Powers. Now, Powers was born in Massachusetts, not so far away in Northampton, and she studied at the Teachers College, which at the time was called the Framingham Normal School. She taught as a school teacher in New Jersey, and her husband, William Powers, um, owned a, a, a lithography company in New York and organized the, lith the Lithographers uh, National Association. It's, it's difficult to say when you're wearing two microphones, as you can tell, right? Um, and while there's not a lot of documentation, you might hope um, that his association proved to be, at the very least, supportive of her artistic career. So the two purchased um, a property called Glebelands in uh, Manchester, which served as their home until his death in 1927. Um, when she sold the property, she moved to the nearby Bornbrook uh, Cottage, which is, as some of you know, you're nodding your heads, which is famous um, for being the home and studio of another important artist in the region, Ogden Pleisner. Now, Mary, turning back to SVAC, Mary took charge of the annual exhibitions. She organized them um, because the organization was run almost primarily by artists who were volunteers. So she organized the exhibitions from 
about 1924, some of the earliest exhibitions over at the Equinox, and continued to do so until 1950, which I think was the first um, exhibition proper at Southern Vermont Art Center. So I want to share two of her, what I think are just um, beautiful, beautiful paintings. Um, the one that is, is up here on the screen titled um, Harvest Field from about 1935, I think you can tell, um, is a watercolor um, with this sort of wide swath of golden brown dominating the foreground and this gently sloping diagonal gives kind of a, um, puts the viewer in this warm, breezy landscape. Um, the other image that I will show you of hers, which is also in the collection of the Southern Vermont Art Center, um, titled Dandelion, I find particularly compelling. Um, it's, it has almost a modern palette to it, almost a monochromatic palette with just a little hint of color um, and gives credibility to this plant that we so often um, pull and, and discard. Um, I don't have an enormous amount of information about her exhibition life outside of the Southern Vermont Art Center. Um, Perhaps it was because she wasn't encouraged. Perhaps she exhibited and it wasn't documented. Perhaps she didn't need to. Um, and like many women artists of this era, some of their stories are just untold. So we will, we will circle back to that point a little bit later. Now, Hilda Belcher um, was a native of Vermont, Pitts, uh, Pittsburgh in particular, and seemingly had the benefit of being raised by a mother who was an artist herself and a father who ran a stained glass company. Um, so from her teenage years on, Belcher spent much of her time either in Newark or New York City um, and returned to Vermont frequently with her family and into her adult years. She also spent um, a lot of time in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, she painted the landscapes there, but often also painted um, the community, the African-American community in Savannah. Um, and many critics have noted that sort of her paintings had a wonderful vibrancy and also um, treated those citizens, now remember, you know, this is in the 1920s and 30s, at the height of the Jim Crow South, really painted her subjects uh, with a sensitivity and respect that you rarely saw um, white artists depicting um, of that community. So uh, what you see on the screen here, the, uh, the younger woman, of course, is, is Hilda and, and her mother. And then uh, the piece here from Southern Vermont Art Center's uh, collection is titled um, The Fear of God. So as you can imagine, um, this is likely painted um, in Savannah, in one of the black churches, and I think showing that just wonderful sort of frenetic energy, passion, um, and emotion um, that, that you might see. Now, she was introduced to Southern Vermont Art Center in 1928 by fellow artist Henry Schnackenberg, um, uh, one of her fellow students at the Art Students League, and she actively participated in SVAC's annual exhibitions almost every year into the late 40s. Um, during her lifetime, she, uh, her work appeared in 28 solo exhibitions. Pretty staggering for, for a woman artist of this time. And today, her work is in the collections of the Fleming Museum, uh, Middlebury College, the Morris Museum of Art in New Jersey, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, um, and Vassar College. And while she, uh, she won many awards during her career, two in particular stand out. 
Um, one is that she was the second woman ever to be elected into the National Academy of Design. Um, and in 1908, she won the New York Watercolor Club's uh, very pre prestigious uh, Strathmore Prize. And according to the New York Times, their quote says, her success in capturing the coveted honor uh, fairly took away the breath of the 692 men competitors who saw themselves obliged to take second place uh, to this very young Vermont student, um, which I think is just a, a wonderful story. Now, Felicia Meyer is, is another one of our, um, our artists who we will explore this evening. And having artists in the family could be both a help or a hindrance um, to a woman's career, particularly you know, during this time period. Um, Felicia Meyer was born to artist parents, Ann Norton and Herbert William Meyer, who you saw in one of our first slides, one of our founding members. Um, and Herbert was particularly well known in some of the most significant institutions of the day. We rattled them off the Art Students League, the Sal McGundy Club, the National Academy of Design. Um, and like many of Vermont's summer residents, the, the New York couple, this New York family, um, summered in Vermont and in Dorset in particular. Um, this gave him the opportunity to become involved with the Southern Vermont artist and gave Felicia the opportunity to become involved um, by extension. Um, an interesting part, while you know Felicia studied art uh, herself, she married a, an even more prominent artist, uh, Reginald Marsh. Now, I, I, see, I see the crowd nodding here. You know what that means. Um, so Reginald Marsh was probably, at his time, one of the most well-known American painters um, really famous for capturing, you know, this sort of gritty, urban, real-life existence of, of people um, in the early part of the century. So Felicia and, and Reginald summered in Vermont, summered in Dorset, and uh, rumor has it that he never quite warmed up to the charms of Vermont. I'm putting it nicely. Um, but likely, likely, Felicia found inspiration um, with the group of Vermont painters. And um, she, she exhibited with SVAC almost every year um, for many, many decades. So to give you just a sense of, of her style and, and just to underscore how accomplished she was in her own right, um, I'll share a few images. Not everyone is dated, but they mostly span between 1935 and 1940. Um, so her beautiful still life here, I think even in a reproduction you can see um, this wonderful play of pattern and color that is recreated in foreground, in middle ground, in background, in this wonderful kind of layering. Um, her landscapes, um, this will look familiar to many of you, the Dorset Quarry, um, and another Dorset scene. And I am stretching just a little bit by showing um, an image of, of hers, of um, the school that was known as the West Road School. It's still on Manchester West Road, although I believe it's a private home now. Um, this is from a local collection that will be shown at the Southern Vermont Arts Center um, this summer. So a great representation of, of her work as well. So we should move uh, a little more quickly through some of these women artists here. Bernadine Custer um, was an Illinois, na uh, Illinois native um, who studied art at an early age 
um, at the Illinois State University and also at the Chicago Art Institute. So, you know, she had her chops. And in 1928, she married the British-born illustrator Arthur Sharp, or Jimmy Sharp. Um, the couple spent uh, a year abroad in, in London and Paris studying art and returning to New York in the 1920s. Um, she, Custer, um, spent her time teaching at the Pratt Institute, creating commercial artwork, editorial art for a number of magazines like The New Yorker and The New Republic. Um, and she also served as the pictorial editor um, for the New York Herald Tribune, covering the city's um, uh, orchestra events. Now, her own career as, as an artist was equally prolific. Um, some of her exhibition credits uh, include the Chicago Art Institute Annual um, and the Corcoran Biennial Exhibition, as well as the Brooklyn Museum's International Watercolor Show. Um, and she was twice awarded uh, mural commissions um, for the Treasury Art Project, which was sort of an, an offshoot of President Roosevelt's uh, federal arts program. So she and Jimmy divided their time between New York and their uh, 19th century farmhouse in Londonderry, and both of them um, worked with the Southern Vermont Art Center from its founding. Um, Custer herself supported even more, serving as a trustee and a juror for its, uh, ex for its annual exhibitions. And she uh, taught locally, got to know many of the residents, and when she died in 1991, I think, um, that was when she donated her home um, to what is now the Londonderry Historical Society. So what you can see, I think, from her images is that her trademark media was a combination of ink, pen and ink, and watercolor, which gives just a very loose, very sort of moving and energetic um, style. So here you see um, two paintings. Um, in the open door and her husband, Arthur Sharp, on the right. The two pieces are almost 20 years apart, the first in 1940, the second in 1960. Um, two very sweet images, uh, Boy and Thought and Duncan Ogden, uh, both from around 1950. Um, the orchestra, which shows some of her um, reporting work and again, two images um, from a local collection that will be shown at Southern Vermont Art Center, um, but I couldn't help but show them to you this evening, War Work and Auction, which is shown here. Now, our next artist, Harriet De Sanchez, uh, her career history breaks the mold a little bit. She had a really interesting life. Uh, she started out as an actress and a model and used the stage name of Harriet Tarzan, often calling herself Tarzan um, in, in different uh, places. Now, we know that she was a successful actress by the time she was 16 in 1920. And in the early 1920s, she was cast in the Greenwich Village Follies, traveling um, all over the world performing. Now, why she left, no one quite knows. Rumor has it that she was actually taller than most of her leading men, and that impacted the casting. Um, so in the, shortly after that, mid 1920 she married a man by the name of Peter de Sanchez, um, and she started studying art, likely after she was no longer involved in the Follies. Um, interestingly, when she was studying at the Art Students League, she came across two artists whose names we already know, Felicia Meyer and Reginald Marsh, the latter of which who was creating stage designs for the Follies. Um, so a very small world here, this artistic community. 
Um, but the group became friends, and Felicia and Reginald, probably mostly Felicia, invited them to summers um, in Vermont, and Harriet started showing her paintings in New York in the 1930s and started showing at the Southern Vermont Art Center exhibitions as early as 1937 and continued to do that until some just a few years before her death in 1950. Um, and so when she, uh, when she died rather young at the age of 53 in Dorset, uh, the Myers family um, organized a retrospective of her work. And so um, I have two paintings in our collection, two um, small um, but beautiful images. And so I share with you Poppies and Daisies, this exquisitely painted still life uh, from 1930. And then um, possibly one of um, the last paintings that she exhibited, at least at Southern Vermont Art Center, um, called View from Dorset Road. And while it looks magnificent on the screen, um, the piece is deceptively small, only about nine by nine inches, but, but beautiful, beautiful little piece. Now, I bring you um, to Elsa Bly who in some ways is sort of the, the patron saint of our education program at Southern Vermont Art Center. Now, like many of our artists, Elsa was born in New York City and studied at all of the important places, Grand Central School and the Art Students League. Um, and just, I, I can't underscore enough how influential the Art Students League was on the artistic development of many of the artists in the early part of the century. It was kind of the antidote to the uber traditional academy. And so this is where um, many of the artists of note, artists who were looking towards Europe, artists who were looking towards modernism, found community um, at the Art student at the Art Students League rather than the Academy. Um, but at the Art Students League, um, Bly would have studied with some of the most important American artists on the scene, George Lukes and John Sloan and Henry Snell. Um, and so in addition to her own painting practice, uh, she had quite a, a career in the arts. She was a founder and director of the Scarsdale um, Arts Guild, um, from the 30s and, and, and continued to direct it into the 1940s. Her earliest association with the Southern Vermont artists is in the mid-1930s, and according to um, our annual rec um, exhibition records, her first exhibition submission was in 1937 um, with a painting called Paulette Green. Now, by the mid-1940s, uh, she was regularly in Dorset uh, and continued exhibiting until uh, the 1980s. So, as you see here, you see um, on the right her painting uh, out in, in Dorset. Um, and I think you can tell, that, you know, she's the one adult in the image here. This is an image of her teaching um, uh, a, a group uh, painting or drawing class, and she was uh, accomplished at teaching children and adults alike. Um, but I want to give you a sense of her painting style. One of her earliest images, um, likely influenced by her New York art school days, is a painting that I discovered in the vault that is in desperate need of conservation, but I show it to you um, just to give you a sense of her sort of artistic journey. Um, when she started developing her mature style, her palette brightened, the brush strokes sort of became more energized and more active, um, and you know, she painted the landscapes not only in Dorset, as you see here, uh, the first one, an untitled scene of Dorset um, 
the horse traders meadow here from about 1950, um, a, an untitled landscape which needs a little more documentation, um, her New York City skyline, and perhaps one of my favorite paintings um, by Bly is um, a painting called Wishing Barbara, um, or Wishful Barbara, excuse me. And, and according to um, the accounts of, of Bly is that this young, this young girl while sitting in the studio, I think it was in the Scarsdale studio, not, obviously, not, the, um, not her Dorset studio, the young girl, as she was sitting there having her portrait painted, mm -hmm. kept wishing for things. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. Now, what a young African-American girl was wishing in 1930s, I can't imagine. Um, but it certainly struck um, Elsa Bly enough to record the story. Now, I am guessing, um, of all of the artists that um, that we've talked about, if you know any of them, you know Anna Mary Robertson Moses, better known as Grandma Moses. And for those of you who are sticklers about details, you might say, now wait a minute, Grandma Moses isn't a Vermont painter. Sure, sure, that's technically true. Um, she grew up just over the border. Um, in, in New York, uh, but certainly had Vermont ties, as, as, I, will, uh, as I will explain, um, and certainly had an impact on, um, on the Southern Vermont Art Center. Now, she was born to um, very, very, very humble beginnings. She was one of 10 children. She attended um, a one-room schoolhouse, which is now part of the Bennington Museum's property. Um, she only went to school until the age of 12, and after that, started working as a housekeeper for local families. So she had given up her education um, and was literally a working adult at the age of 12. Um, no surprise she married young young-ish, um, and her husband, uh, Thomas Moses, uh, was a farmer as well. Their adult life began in Virginia, and then uh, they returned in the early 20th century, I think 1905 or 1906, returned and settled in nearby Eagle Bridge. Now, Moses she never received formal training in art. She never received formal education. Um, but she actually uh, was artistic most of her life in the domestic sphere, in, in the domestic sphere, through embroidery, through painting handmade cards, um, quilting, and, and other such things. Um, and so when she was widowed at the age of 67, um, she moved in with her, her daughter, uh, her daughter and her children, um, who sort of coined the nickname Grandma Moses. And by the mid, uh, by her mid 70s, as arthritis was making some of the more sort of technical artistic pursuits difficult, it's hard to embroider if you have severe arthritis in your hands. Well, she just decided to start painting. Um, and so she painted prolifically in her. 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, over you know, 1,500 paintings. And the story goes that sometime in Hoosick Falls in the late 1930s, a local art collector spotted her artwork in a drugstore and bought up every single one of them for a couple dollars a piece. Now, obviously, he had New York collections because, connections because the next year her paintings were included in um, the uh, MoMA's, the, the New York Museum of Modern Art's exhibition called Contemporary 
unknown American painters. Um, and so from there, her work was picked up by uh, the Gallery Saint Etienne, which focused on primitive and native painters. And somehow, by some stroke of luck, her imaginative, sort of naive paintings struck a chord with the American public. Um, and by the 1950s, um, her exhibition opportunities had widened. Attendance at her shows was breaking records. Um, and literally every painting she created was selling. Um, some of them are, are selling uh, upwards of, of a million dollars. Um, so interestingly, now, he's, as I said, she, she's not a Vermont native, but Southern Vermont Art Center had the distinction of being the location for her 100th birthday. And the painting by one of our early founding members, Dean Fawcett, who created a portrait of her, um, uh, was, was unveiled at the birthday party. Now, that portrait resides in the Bennington Museum, so I share with you a portrait that was created uh, by another woman artist, Clara Saprell. More to come on that in a moment. But just to give you a sense of Grandma Moses' style, um, Husik Falls uh, painted in, in 1944, and the wind in winter in, in 1950, you really get a sense of this intentional nostalgic style. Uh, the style itself skews perspective a little intentionally, I think. Um, details and, and figures are, are meant to um, look a little off, a little childlike. And of course, she intentionally doesn't paint the modern trappings that one would see, telephone poles and tractors and cars. Now remember, this is 1950. Um, so she's fabricating a little bit of that nostalgia and, and fabricates that with her, um, her personality as well. So a few other women to talk about. Um, Marion Hughes, um, again, was a very well-educated, well-established um, artist. She, she started out um, at the New School of Design in, in Boston and studied under the very well-known Charles Webster Hawthorne, that American Impressionist who was the founder of the Cape Cod Art School. Um, and and Marion herself uh, was a talented artist, educator, and administrator founding the Springfield Art School um, in Springfield, Mass. And she was also an artist for um, the WPA, for the Works Progress Administration. Now, in the 1930s, um, she started coming to Vermont. She had a home in Palinol, summered there, and according to our records, uh, started showing um, in the annual exhibitions at the Southern Vermont Art Center in 1933 and continued until the early 1960s. Um, now, the subjects of her paintings uh, chronicle her travels uh, abroad as well as her travels in New England. And during her lifetime, she was honored with numerous awards. And her paintings can be found not only in our collection, but in the collection of the Fuller uh, Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, even the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So I share with you two images here uh, from the, the late 1930s, according to, to my records, um, the Old Lovett's Burial Ground here, which is in the Southern Vermont Art Center's collection, um, and Threshing at Black's Farm, which I think is wonderful and, and vibrant and, and, and very modern in a sense. Um, from uh, the local collection that will be shown um, at the Vermont Art Center this summer. 
Now, as I, as I wind down and wind to our, um, uh, our, our Q&A, or the rest of our time together, the last two artists that I have to show you are particularly um, special to me. Alfreda Abbey is, is the first of them. Um, and in some ways, she might be the most versatile um, and technically accomplished of the artists that we've shown this evening. Um, she was born in Washington, D.C., but spent most of her life either in upstate New York or Vermont. She was a sculptor, a wood engraver, a botanical illustrator, and a self-publisher who created um, numerous hand-printed books on her own printing press. Um, her sculpture that you see working on here um, was uh, displayed at the 1939 um, New York's World Fair. Uh, it was displayed at Cornell University where she received her degrees in both illustration and architecture um, as early as 1940, uh, I believe. And she began, um, she began coming to Manchester, to, to Vermont, in the mid-1960s and was, I think, fully a resident there by 1974. Um, so no surprise, uh, as an accomplished artist, she became interested in the Southern Vermont Art Center and the then president, Carlton Howe, um, was so impressed by her talents and her desire to teach printmaking classes, he helped her find a printmaking press, um, which enabled her to teach. And she created um, a number of the Art Center's programs, invitations, and, and posters for many years. Um, I share with you some of her woodcut prints. Um, the the two you see here, um, Spring Pond and Valley Farm. Um, another two, most of these are not dated. Uh, I wish I had better dates for you, but her, her, many of her pieces were printed multiple times. Um, Storm Fantasy and Midsummer, um, High Clouds, and a piece that I discovered of Carcassonne. Um, France. Now, I mentioned that some of these artists are particularly special to me. Um, when I started um, at the Southern Vermont Art Center and took over my, my then office, um, it, it left a little to be desired. Uh, there were a number of people that were in and out of the director's office, and um, I looked about and thought it really needed a style upgrade. And one day I went into the closet, and now remember, this is kind of this funny house that has bedroom and adjoining closet that are now staff offices. So I went into the closet and found boxes and boxes of these amazingly crisp and beautiful woodcut prints. Um, not accessioned prints, because as you know, prints are printed in multiples, so there can be 10, 25, 50 in a run. Um, and so I took a couple of them down to our local framer, framed them up, um, and they have been on the walls of my office um, from just about the time that I started there. So. I find them particularly beautiful. And if you have ever tried woodcut engraving, it's maddeningly complex. You know, a block for every, every color. Um, and so her technical proficiency is, um, is amazing. How am I doing on time, Gloria and Liz? Okay, I can get through our last artist. Um, so finally, Clara Saprell. Um, again, she, she started out um, under difficult circumstances. Her family life was difficult. She was um, the sixth child and only daughter of Frances and, um, and Fanny Saprell. And her father died before she was born, 
leaving her mother um, to work a number of odd jobs just to pay the bills and to make ends meet. Now, her older brother, Frank, um, when he was a little bit older, moved to Buffalo um, and opened up a photography studio. And so Clara, as a young girl, started assisting her brother in the photography studio and learned all of, of the um, techniques of, of the trade. Um, and some would say certainly outpaced her brother in her technical proficiency. Um, so she, you know, she exhibited some of her first photographs at the Buffalo Camera Club, although she was not allowed to be a member because she was a woman. Um, she showed prints in their annual exhibition. Um, in, in one of the years, I think it was the 1913 year, she won six prizes more than any of the actual members. Um, so, you know, in the, in the early part of the century, like many of our artists, she moved to New York um, and established her own photography studio. Um, and because of her reputation um, that had grown in Buffalo, she started uh, amassing a, a, a wonderful roster of clients. And she photographed some of um, the era's most important artists writers um, and cultural icons that, that you know, we have today. Robert Frost, Albert Einstein, Langston Hughes. Um, and so as a pictorial photographer, she was really interested in, in capturing her sitter in this sort of beautiful, soft focus. I'll show you a couple of her, her images here. Um, one of her claims to fame is that um, her, one of her photographs uh, was the first uh, that was acquired, the first artwork by a woman artist that was acquired uh, by the Museum of Modern Art. This is a, a portrait of her. Um, the portrait in our collection of the sculptor Malvinia Hoffman. Um, um, Eleanor Roosevelt and, and Robert Frost, um, and a, a beautiful image of a chapel that is not identified. So after our talk, if any of you know this image, um, please come see me after class. Um, but the Vermont connection is what I should get to. And so in, um, in 1937, um, Saprell moved to, to Manchester um, at the suggestion of some of her uh, writer friends and, and Robert uh, Frost in particular. Um, and that's where she met uh, Phyllis Fenner, who was a writer, librarian, um, uh, anthologist of children's books. Uh, and their partnership continued through uh, the rest of Saprell's life for, I think, another 35 years or so. Um, the two of them had an architect, Harold Olmsted, build them a house in Manchester, which included her very first dark room. Um, and over the course of her lifetime, she has her work has been shown um, in over a hundred photography exhibitions um, around the world. So I told you that her story was important to me. Um, and, and I promise this has a point. In my early days at Southern Vermont Art Center, um, in, in the winter, it was, it, was, it was quiet times back then. Um, in one of my first few weeks, a, a couple came um, into my office and, and they said, you know, we would like to talk to the director, the new director. And I said, uh-oh, 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 <laughs> what did I do? Um, and, and this lovely couple said to me, well, our son works here, and he told us that you live at 90 West Road. I said, well, that's right. And, and they said, well, did you know that that house was owned by the famous photographer Clara Saprell? No. Um, 
And they handed me this long out of print book of, of Clara's photography and said, well, we thought we've had this for many years. This couple was actually from Buffalo. Um, so they knew her story um, and were also uh, summer residents here in Manchester. Um, but somehow, by some incredibly strange coincidence, I live in the house that Clara Saprell lived in. Um, so, you know, so as I conclude this talk, you know, is there some common theme? Is there some brilliant thesis to tie all this together? I'm not sure I can offer that. Um, our women were roughly contemporaries, um, their most active periods being the first half of the 20th century, and their backgrounds varied greatly. Um, some were born into extraordinary fortune and found ways to, to use their, their good luck and fortune um, to make their communities better, while others overcame poverty and fought for every opportunity that they have. Um, as artists, they are as diverse as anyone could imagine. Um, some achieved um, international success and others remained obscure outside of their own communities. But each of them came to Vermont either you know, by choice or by circumstance, and each one of them has had a lasting impact on this organization, and I personally feel connected and indebted to each and every one of them. Now, I will say that there are many, many artists that I haven't included. B. Jackson, Jane Armstrong, Lee Urich, Emily Winthrop Miles, I, I could go on and on, uh, but that's another lecture. Um, and so I am happy to entertain questions, um, and I will fully admit that some of them might require further research. Uh, but what I also hope is that you in the audience, um, if any of you were fortunate enough to know any of these women, I hope you can share your stories with me and with your fellow audience members. So thank you.